So I want to welcome you all back to our masterclass uh, with Arturo Farrell on Jazz as Global Experiment. We're thrilled to have you back. And I, without further ado, I am going to turn you over to Arturo. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, first... I have power. I love power. Oh my god, power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to uh, just. I know I, you, you know, Rennie told me I didn't have to do this, but I just I did want to apologize to you guys for losing it the last time we met. It's been really raw emotions and dealing uh, with with teachers is always like I feel like I'm about to be called into the principal's office you all terrify me and I love you both so it's a series of conflicting uh incredible like admiration and love and profound fear so I, I apologize for losing it I'm glad I had the keyboard handy so that I could uh hide behind what I really do um and what I'll do is I, I want to make sure that you you guys feel comfortable with what I'm doing. I'm just going to kind of ask you to feel free to um, mute or unmute, uh, interrupt. This is I'm so low on protocol, and what I usually tell my students as soon as I meet them is I have no clue what I'm doing. I've prepared a lesson plan, but I'm going to throw it out the window. And furthermore, my job is to confuse you as best I can so that you can figure out your own way of dealing with the knowledge and the misknowledge and the misinformation that you read in history books. And most of my students look terrified at that proposition. They look up at me and go, and then they figure out that they have to think for themselves and they have to kind of understand what, they, what they're hearing and whether or not it passes it through their filters. And so I'm going to kind of quickly go through a real... Uh, a fast kind of recap of what I, I'm talking about. The, the, the concept for me of jazz as global citizenry is, is very simple. Um, I think somehow it got lost in the global experiment, but it is, it, 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 it's about the responsibility of a jazz musician. Not any more or any less than any other musician, but I think in particular jazz lends itself to uh, being something that has begun in globality, filters through the new world, and makes its way uh, back to globality. And in fact, if you trace the roots of, uh, and I'll show you this in a short while, um, uh, uh, Ned Sublet wrote a very interesting book called Cuba and its music and its people. And in this work, he argues on behalf of the idea that a lot of the information that makes its way into Afro-Cuban music really has its roots in the relationship of uh, Morocco and the Moors and North Africa and uh, uh, Spain. And if you go to flamenco singers and ask them what they do, they'll say that they get their real information from the Middle East and that the roots of flamenco are in the Middle East and in India. Um, and so a lot of the performance practice uh, that uh, we take for jazz and jazz-like uh, performance and jazz performance practice is really global. For me, it really is global. And if you study improvisation at all, and all of you have, you'll see that the improvisational practices in, in uh, classical uh, Indian music and uh, Irish fiddling, and it all comes from the same sources. So for me, being a, a jazz musician means being aware of globality. So my entire career has been marked by the desire to uh, um, connect cultures. Um, last year, two years ago, I did a, a concert called the uh, Middle Eastern Roots of Afro-Cuban Jazz, and I went to Kuwait and said, and I told you a little bit about this in the, in the last uh, time that we had together, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of quickly gloss through, uh, and I think I figured out the, uh, the technical end of things. We tried it. I tried it out on my wife. She's become my guinea pig. She absolutely hates it. She knows I'm going to do, I'm about to teach a class. I go, Allison. She goes, yes, I'm going to get on. <laughs> so then, then we go and go through the same silly experiment. But I think I got it. I think I got it. I think I got it. So I'm going to take control of your screen for a second and just kind of go quickly through the keynote presentation that I did last week and put it on your screen and just kind of review everything that we talked about. Um, we talked about jazz as global citizenry. I introduced the idea that I know how to use Keynote, but though I don't know how to use it in Zoom, but at least I know how to use Keynote, which makes me absolutely positively educated. Um, and we started by showing you, I started by telling you a little bit about myself, about my myself as an immigrant, about my roots, about my father, Chico Farrell, who was a 
very, very, very beloved uh, figure in Afro-Cuban jazz, coming to the United States uh, from Mexico in 1906. I don't want to say. I'm just going to leave that part out. <laughs> and then uh, taking piano lessons, uh, learning Mozart, Bach conventions, and discovering Elton John and thinking that was the zenith. But let's face it, y'all. Madman Across the Water, that was the best Elton John. It didn't get better than that. But in any case... Um, I broke into. My, I told you about breaking into my mother and father's record collection because they kept them in the rec, under lock and key and discovering Herbie Hancock and thinking that that was the epiphany, the moment that, that my life began. Um, so I thought I could be a, a great pianist. I learned to play the piano. I thought if I was a great pianist and learned to play the piano, I'd be happy. And I found that I wasn't. So I figured that the next thing to do was to be employed as a great pianist. And I did that and discovered that I wasn't happy. Then I figured I needed a little notoriety in order to be happy. And so I got a little bit of a career going. I started working with Carla Blay, NEA Jazz Master, and uh, still quite, hadn't quite figured out um, what it was that it would take to make me happy. And then I discovered, of course, Mingus, and I discovered his composition, which I played you a little of, uh, called uh, Fables of Fobus, which deals with the very regrettable uh, Arkansas Democratic Governor, Orville E. Fobus, and his, uh, and his attempts to keep, uh, keep black students apart from white students and to avoid uh, the, uh, losing elections and being unpopular and all the stuff that we're seeing played out on such a big screen today uh the same nonsense that we were dealing in 1957 is still happening we know that because of this moment in history i uh, read to you from his speech and i also talked a little bit about uh how discovering mingus was revolutionary for me it was the first awakening in my life of a citizenry response to my art that i had a, a response that i needed to be a good citizen with my art and that that citizenry of course had to deal with social justice and it had to be and 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 at that point of course i had no idea that uh, you know i had kind of bought hook line and sinker into the idea that jazz was an american experiment the jazz was an american invention and the jazz was the property of american musicians so i hadn't quite understood yet that um that it, the, the roots and the trade roots and the spice roots and the different uh, places that this music that we call ours really comes from. And it is ours, by the way. For those of you who might take exception to the idea that I am uh, advocating the jazz is not American. It is very much this version that we know is very much part of the American uh, uh, black experience. But that same experience, that same experience happened in Colombia where Porro was uh, created. That same experience uh, was brought to the shores of Venezuela where Jaropo was created. That same experience that experienced the terrorism of an enslaved peoples was also brought to Colombia where Pacifico was created. So the same elements of all this music that was uh, that later on becomes what we call American jazz has uh, variants of it throughout the Americas. And that's when I first really realized that um, there was a social aspect to this music that I call jazz. And then I think I... I shared with you that that wasn't actually a revolutionary concept that the father of modern jazz louis uh louis armstrong also experienced uh this racism and he was a very socially woke and conscious human being and i played you a little bit of what did i do to be so black and blue so all along i'm just a young musician i'm like trying to gig i'm trying to get so ahead in my field, I'm trying to make connections and, and, and something's happening to me that's creating a different uh, interpretation of what it means to be happy. It isn't until later that I realized that uh, I was not to be happy until I connected my music, my craft, my practice with both globality and social responsibility. Um, we heard a little bit of, of the heartbreak of Billie Holiday and Strange Fruit. I told you the story of being in Abu Dhabi and having a having a woman in full burqa and full religious gear break down and cry when I played her uh, this piece of music, having absolutely no experience with the nature of race relations in the United States. It was a very moving moment for me to see somebody in a completely different culture be destroyed by the way that Americans have treated one another. And a very, very telling moment for this moment in history. Um, and then I started telling you about how I discovered that this was a problem that affected not just African Americans, but Mexican Americans. And I read you this quote about Mexican lynching, which uh, was a, a very real, real uh, 
situation of Mexican influence. The, the history of the geopolitical history of the Mexico and the United States is quite, quite, quite uh, horrifying. Um, and it's an it's a it's a it's a relationship that is that is not going to go away because, f quite frankly, we're attached to one another ge geographically, and we've been a part of each other's culture for a long time. So we're stuck with each other. This whole border uh, manipulation by the president, the present administration, and its allies, is a is a construct. Um, and to prove that, I also uh, talked to you about something we call the Fandango Doctrine, where I went to uh, Mexico and looked out across the, uh, the border to San Diego, that's my hand, touching the fence, the actual fence, the actual fencing that separates Tijuana from Friendship Park in San Diego, or really what is San Isidro. Um, and I told you about my friends. Uh, the Son Harocha musicians and the Villalobos brothers. I showed you this beautiful clip, which I'll show you again for just a moment, of two brothers. That's uh, Alberto Villalobos. On the other side is Ernesto Villalobos, who could not get a visa to come in to uh, the United States, into Mexico. He couldn't leave the United States and come back in. Um, and, but this is what happens every day for people who live along the border. <laughs> So that's actually from um, uh, from from the Fandango Fronterizo Festival, which was founded by Jorge Francisco Castillo 13 years ago, which is a, a celebration of music called Son Jarocho, which is Afro-Mexican, also known as Afro-Mexican music. Again, music that is uh, performed on a variety of guitar-like instruments called jaranas. And these jaranas have different uh, pitches and different uh, functions, very much like an African percussion section, where you have different sized drums uh, doing very specific patterns that come together to make a pointillistic uh, painting. And um, and so this this gentleman, as I told you before, and, and by the way, this is since then, I don't know if it came out then, but the movie's out, Fandango at the Wall is on HBO Max, and it's really, really gorgeous movie. I'm very proud of being af affiliated with these folks, but if you if you have a chance to see Fandango at the Wall, um, you should. It's a beautiful movie. First of all, uh, because it brings together the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra, Regina Carter and Antonio Sanchez, the Villalobos brothers, uh, Saba Modulevi, Rahim Al Haj, with uh, incredible Son Jarocho masters like uh, Patricio Hidalgo, Ramon Gutierrez Herrera, Wendy and Tacho Utrera. Uh, one of the most moving moments in that uh, film is a poem that is uh, given to us by Fernando Guadarrama. And uh, if you can get through that poem without crying, I'm, I'd be really impressed because it talks about our identity. Who are we? How do I identify? I identify as a child of Spain, as a child of Africa, as a child of the New World, as a child. And you can't look at that. You can't hear that poetry without us understanding how we really are uh, uh, set free from uh, uh, fixing our identities in little integers and metrics. And I think that that, that, that that one scene in the movie where he speaks freely uh, is, is, is really important. I hope you get a chance to see Fandango at the Wall. This is the trailer. You already I'm saw it, so we're going to move on. Them. I think I showed you the scene where we jammed with a horse. But just for uh, shits and giggles, we'll see it again. Jamming with another species. Out came the saxophones, the guitars, and the horse. One of those people is Regina Carter, and that's uh, Chad Lefkowitz Brown jamming. Can you imagine a MacArthur fellow jamming with a horse? It's a moment that you'll never see again. Interspecies jam. This is us performing in the Bronx with the wonder, wonderful Julia de Palacio. And those are some of the members of the uh, Son Jarocho community in Veracruz. 
as as we said, the um, I think we got to that point before I had to kind of take off, and um, we talked then about uh, the the direction that my work was heading in. The direction that my work was heading in was decidedly Middle East, especially after reading Ned Sublet's book. And this is me meeting with some uh, a wonderful oud player, the gentleman whose back is turned to us, and is an oudist, uh, and he is we're in the desert in. Uh, I'm going to take an extended bit of your time to play you something uh, in a minute. But the uh, one, the Udistu, the, this is the desert, uh, I think, near somewhere between uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And this is me, uh, <laughs> them teaching me the Kuwaiti rhythms, the Kuwaiti percussionists who... Uh, the play uh, called Boom Diwan, and this is the Kuwaiti percussion music that they taught me, which somehow I, I managed to play very naturally, which surprised them. But it's beautiful. <laughs> Khaliji rhythms in Kuwait. And then I figured I would teach them some of my uh, rhythms, so I taught them. Uh, a mambo going into a wawan ko for those of you who are not latin music conscious that means that we're going from a two three clave into a three two clave that's double in speed which is not an easy trick to pull off it involves you playing something like one two one two three and then when you double up instead of one two one Two, three, it goes one, two, three, one, two. So anyway, somehow they understood that uh, that that clave pulse and how it switches direction when you double in tempo. Still, as you remember, as you recall, I didn't feel good about it because I was at the piano and they were on the floor. And so I sat down next to them with a red piano. Okay, the idea that jazz is global is highly politicized. It means it cannot be nationalized. It cannot be used to justify political, religious, or philosophical ideology. This contradicts the typical institutional interpretations of jazz as American-born jazz is an African inheritance. Filtered throughout all of the Americas and best realized as a universal and global music that speaks to the truth of love as a response to oppression and hatred. It also serves a journalistic fi function, as does all art, which means it reflects as an artist. This is what happened to me. I did not become a musician. I did not become an artist. I didn't become a teacher until I realized that I had a function as a journalist, that I had a function and a social responsibility to use my art in the way that I understood, which is to teach, to share, to learn, and to understand the globality of our of our lives and our nation and the reality of who we are. And this is one of the things that... So I'm going to take a minute before I continue because uh, the second part of this is kind of a presentation of my creative practice as a global citizen. Um, and uh, I'm going to escape this and change... Uh, change uh, platforms so I'm gonna it's a quick 10 12 minute video I want you to see that kind of explains uh, a little bit of my work in the Middle East a little, uh, the Middle East to me is, is excruciatingly fascinating as a source of nutrition for the practice of of jazz it's really directly tied to my practice as an improviser and I'm gonna just kind of give you a this was an, a pilot for uh, a, an Anthony Bourdain type uh, show in which not only do I go around eating with people, which is easy for me, but um, I also go around jamming with people. 
and uh, so I think it's it, this is going to explain a lot about my philosophy of jazz as global citizenry and uh, jazz as global culinary. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE, lies on the eastern shore of the Arabian Peninsula and is one of the jewels, or you could say the pearl, of the Arabian Gulf. It was the world center for the pearl trade in the late 19th century. Arturo, and its we're not pearl seeing diving a video. And economy You're not seeing a video, of course. No. Occupations during but the you did see it up to this point, right? Yep. Okay. I, you know, that's, I keep forgetting you have to unshare screen and then share the right screen. Do you see that now? Yep. Okay, good. I'll start it again. I'm so sorry. Do you hear it too? You heard it, right? Okay. Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE, lies on the eastern shore of the Arabian Peninsula and is one of the jewels, or you could say the pearl of the Arabian Gulf. It was the world center for the pearl trade in the late 19th century, and its pearl diving and fishing economy were primary local occupations during the 19th and the first half of the 20th century. Then, as the saying goes, they struck oil. The very earliest settlements near present-day Abu Dhabi date back to the Bronze Age, around two to 3,000 BC. Modern-day Abu Dhabi is now one of the wealthiest cities in the world and has become a crossroads for international commerce, based in large part on its oil business. And with the Sheikh Syed Grand Mosque, the new Louvre Abu Dhabi Museum, New York University's Arts Center and Art Gallery, its jaw-dropping skyscrapers and white sand beaches looking out over the turquoise gulf, Abu Dhabi is a major center for international tourism, and as it turns out, music. should be doing all of us should be playing music and experiencing one of these cultures. I ceased to think about the music as just a series of, of sounds. Thinking that the music was actually a medicine and uh, a necessity, again, to make the work possible. Seeing how the UAE has built so quickly uh, because it's embraced that cosmopolitanism as its, sort of, as its strength in the world, Without losing heritage. Now they start to inter international food, like egg, like mm -hmm. corvasso, yeah. coffee, like that. All the traditional food, this is more traditional food. This one is the Yeah. 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 Sweet. I have, I have definitely got, I have found my home. <laughs> <laughs> the best food. Yeah. This looks like a taco, but it's. I think we're going to cancel the master class, Fred, and we cancel it. We might be here for a while. <laughs> basic rhythm in, uh, in in North Africa, it's called uh, Shabi, and and then you have like different rhythm, different um, traditional music in different parts of Morocco. You know, the singers are amazing to me. They're amazing because they, we take this and it becomes our vehicle. What's it like when this is your vehicle? That must be incredible. For example, today I'm <laughs> <laughs> I had the flu and I've been coughing for, so for five days. The so. instrument is a needle of fun. Yes, exactly.
The people here are so, they are so giving and just really hospitable and beautiful. I have been all over the world many, many times, but this is, this is a place that's very special because folks are really, really open and, and sweet. Yeah, I'll try playing the drum. <laughs> this is a taiko drum group in the Middle East. That's beautiful, man. So, that's incredible. Talk about globality. Don't stop. Don't stop. Stop, stop, stop. And, and then we got into a duel. Actually called yeah. Cuba meets Kaliji, but it should be called Cuba meets Kaliji meets Japan. I guess of course. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's an amazing lute player. He's one of the world's greatest How do you lutists. Teach Western musicians to hear quarter tone. I give them the major C. Right. All musicians they know about this major C. Of course. So I will tell him so from C to D, there is full. Tone, right? right? So mm -hmm. you so can hear here. Yeah. There's a full tone. Yes, from, from C to D. Okay, from D to me to E, it's full. Right. So minus one quarter tone. <laughs> you can, I can't do it on the piano. <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah. It's in between. It's in between. spit at me because that's all you hear about camels. <laughs> the music that's most personal to me is um, the music of my mixed heritage. So the music from Bahrain, mm -hmm. but also um, jazz, but British jazz. My granddad used to be a jazz trumpeter no kidding. Yeah, in the 50s. So both of those types of music are very personal to me. Because I've rediscovered who I am, um, my ad identity is now really important. Right. And I think, yeah, I feel very um, strongly and want to bring that out and share my story because I've been holding it back for so long, you know? This earlier, uh, that scene that you saw the back of the gentleman who uh, is playing Oud. Literally in the middle of the desert. I don't know how many cultures are in that setting, at least a dozen. guys that you saw from, from Kuwait. So it's boom period to Diwan. As you know, we, we came up with the name together. You know, <laughs> Are we, we drinking? I don't know. There's no guy. Yeah, so the boom is, uh, is a kind of ship that was used for both pearl diving and uh, going around the Indian Ocean. These ships, especially the ones that went to from Zanzibar to India um, and everywhere in between, was that the ships became these vehicles for not only the trade of goods, 
but of ideas, of music, uh, of food, uh, and, and certainly by default of culture. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, our group, Boom Di Wan, the metaphor of the boom, uh, is very evident in this collaboration that you invited us to do with you. That our ship is docking at your ports mm -hmm. for an exchange, mm -hmm. for a trade, where you influence us and we influence you, um, and something bigger happens in between us. A greater hope. Living in the past is not what the past is for. The past is to point us to the future. A lot of people live in the past. I guess it's safe. <laughs> it's interesting to me that, that there was indigenous people in South America, Central America, for thousands of years that parallel the people of the Middle East and, and the Arab world. That's another thing that I find really beautiful about Arabic culture. There's such a, a premium on hospitality. Yes. There's such a premium on feeding others. There's such a premium on sharing. And welcoming and sharing. I think that's extraordinary. That's right. And I think that that's a beautiful metaphor, not only for music and for culture, but for respect. Mm -hmm. That you can't really hope to exchange anything if one ship is above another. Surrounded by beauty, surrounded by culture, makes one humbled. And to think that there are those who would use culture and fear and hatred to divide us from others is, is abhorrent. And uh, a lot of people have misconceptions about what it's like to be in the Middle East Mexico and all kinds of places that uh, we're taught to fear and quite the opposite this beauty is a reflection of the beauty of these people the beauty of their traditions their cultures their rituals their peacefulness their generosity their charity their warmth and their humanity and what I've learned from being here in Abu Dhabi UAE is that I know so little about what it means to be human. I have so much to learn from these gracious human beings. I have a lot of work to do and a lot more exploring about the rhythms of life. So one of the things that happened um, in, in my life is that I, I, grow, I grew up to understand that if I was gonna be a jazz musician, and there, there is such a thing as jazz. If I was going to be a jazz musician, I would have to understand uh, where it came from, what it is, and where it's going. And that if I, it was a journey that it was basically inseparable from my journey as a human being. Um, and so uh, I'm going to go on now and talk a little bit about, about my creative practice. Does anyone have any questions at this point? By the way, when I got to Kuwait... Um, of course, it's a very, it's a very religious country, and I got to uh, Ghazi's house, and um, the first thing he did was offer me a beer. Um, <laughs> I was just terrified, that, you know. Some, of the, he said, "Nah, we drink here, just not openly." <laughs> anyway, so I want to talk about my creative practice and how, how I bring. Uh, my understanding of globality to my work. But I want to take a minute. Any questions at all whatsoever, please interrupt me. I have one question. Sure. Um, how, how did you end up kind of hooking up with those musicians in, in uh, Abu Dhabi? Like, was there a cultural exchange that was set up ahead of time through like Lincoln Center, or was it just like connections that you had established in the United States? That's the same way that I kind of made uh, my connections with uh, Mexico and, and with Cuba. Um, personal introductions with one person led to 
a series of introductions to other people. The person that I was that I'm very lucky to be friends with is uh, a person by the name of Bill Bragan, and Bill Bragan was uh, uh, the, one of the original uh, artistic directors of Joe's Pub and Lincoln Center Out of Doors, and uh, and uh, and we've kept in touch with each other over years and as soon as I started reading about the Middle Eastern roots of this music he invited me to Abu Dhabi on a fact finding mission and went and actually accompanied me to Kuwait and to other places in the Middle East and uh, and made the introduction to these incredible musicians uh, same thing with the Fandango at the Wall project I worked very closely with a man named Kabir Sagal and uh, and told him about this article that I read and he said well let's just go to Veracruz let's just go to Tijuana and we just literally um that's the way that I you know it's either a friend or something I'm working on an on an opera right now the opera is 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 Lucero it's about a man named Marcel Lucero who was killed in a hate crime on Patchogue Long Island and the way that I started my research was literally by going to Patchogue Long Island <laughs> and finding people who knew either Marcelo Lucero or Jeffrey Conroy the the person who killed him um and literally cold calling people going I went to uh Ecuador to meet with Marcelo's family and uh, by talking to human beings I learned that where his sister lived, and and met her. And um, but Cuba is a different thing, of course, because my 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 father was Cuban, and so that my name is very 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 recognizable in Cuba. But the way that I met musicians there was by going to rumbas and jam sessions and discargas. And sometimes, you know, I, I like to say this to young people that, that you can, you don't really wait for an introduction. You don't really wait for a phone call. I, I, you know, if I think, if I want to write an opera, if I want to create an organization, I kind of just do it. And I figure that there's enough uh, energy in, in, in that that somebody will be attracted to it. And I think, and you know, I think that uh, it hasn't actually been that easy sometimes being connected because it works against you. My father is Chico Farrell. So actually that kind of meant that people thought I was him. <laughs> And it made it really difficult because people thought, well, oh, you're going to have to be a really uh, quite an extraordinary talent to do that. And, uh, you know, I re it took me a long time. And I think I told you the story. I don't know if I did. But I wanted to be a composer in the worst way. But being the son of Chico Farrell was like, he, he wrote the Afro-Cuban jazz suite. So I was a closet composer. <laughs> I was a closet composer. I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and never played anything. And then one day I did a concert with uh, with Winton and Chico at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, and I got home, and there was a message on my on my answering machine in a fake British accent, and somebody said, "Atira Mohondiro, you sound as stuffy as you look. Let it be known that you don't have a fortieth of your father's talent. In fact, I foresee you picking through garbage," and so. <laughs> I looked at the phone and I was like in shock, like the thing that I feared most in my entire existence had just happened to me. <laughs> and I was actually alive. I was cool. I was not hurt. My world didn't end. And what's more, I wasn't the kind of asshole who went around making really, really life destructive phone calls. You know? So in some ways, I, I, I kind of created all of the things I created and all of the projects I, I create really out of personal relationships, on, you know. Anybody else have a question? We'd love to answer questions. I have, a, I have a question about, I, I understand that this may not be a simple answer, but, um, you know, Ned Zeppelin's book, right, covers a lot of the history of Cuban music and its influences. Is there any kind of similar text or text that you like um, looking at South and Central America? You know, I can't say that I, I have really studied a lot of t uh, texts about South and Central America. Just I guess because it's where I come from, I just grew up in that in that environment. I did read a book uh, about what Afro Mexican music is, and um, but that that's it's 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 you know I I kind of grew up learning about South and Central music from playing it. Uh, you know, musicians uh, that I came into contact, Huevito Lobaton, Afro-Peruvian, Afro-Andean drummer. Uh, just talking to him is a history lesson. Um, so so, so that, that part of my life was, was I probably should uh, 
do a little more scholarly study about uh, South and Central music. But I certainly, I feel like, it, I, and I feel this is true, this is good advice for all of us. Um, some of us have done this, some of us have not. But learn, learn to play uh, hand drums. For those of you who are interested in jazz and who are interested in Latin music or South and Central music, learn, just get, you can, you, by the way, you can learn all of this on the YouTube, of course. But get yourself a hand drum and learn a tumbao. Learn a mambo tumbao. Just play it. Just play it. Just play it. Um, in fact, I will teach you one right now. I will teach you how to play a basic tumbao. It's easy. Ready? It takes four parts of your hand. It takes your, the, what we call um, open. The open sound is where you kind of bounce off the drum like this. I don't know if you can see my hand. But you bounce off the side of the drum like this, right? And then you will take, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to switch views as I explain this. Okay, so you should be able to see my piano. I'm going to turn it off and just use it as a drum, which is what it really is anyway. <laughs> so what you're going to do is you're going to take your right hand and you're going to bounce off the side of the skin like this on, on beat four. One, two, three, open. Well, it's not off. Open one, two, three, open one, two, three. Now the other part of your hand, the fleshy part is called the heel and the tips of the fingers is called the toe. So what you can do is you're gonna go on beat four, you're gonna go one, two, three, open, and then you go open heel toe. So we'll do that again. We'll just get that far. One, two, three. Open heel toe. Open heel toe. Open heel toe. Just it. Open heel toe. Now the next thing you want to do is is do the slap where you bring your hand, you bring the, the, the palm part of your hand right down on the skin and stop all the vibration. So now you have open, heel toe, and slap. And they come right after in, in that order. So it's one. Let me move my microphone. So it's one, two, three, open, heel, toe, slap. That's it. Open, heel, toe, slap. Open, heel, toe, slap. Open, heel, toe, slap. Open, heel, toe, slap. We're going to add a toe. Open, heel, toe, slap, 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 toe. We're going to add a heel. Open, heel, toe, slap, toe, heel. Open, heel, toe, slap, toe, heel. Open, heel, toe, slap, toe, heel. Now, you might think, oh, I got this. I'm a master now. I can handle this. This is easy. I got this, man. I'm cool. But you, you, you know what helps is to be able to know the pattern by word. If you can say open heel toe slap toe, you can say open heel toe slap toe heel toe because you can break it up into movements. So the last movement is toe heel toe. So open slap. I'm sorry. Open slap toe. Oh my God. Open toe, open heel toe slap, open heel toe slap toe heel toe, open heel toe slap toe heel toe, right? So the idea is you're going one, two, three, open heel toe slap. And let's let's build it one one layer at a time, okay? So if you if you want to practice too long, you can unmute so I can hear you, or you can stay muted if you should so desire. Thing is, don't don't you know don't do this on your on your friend's head. It's not a good idea. It's very simple. Here we go. We're going to do one, one layer at a time. Ready? One, two, three. Open. 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 Open heel. Open heel. Open heel. Open heel. Open heel toe. Open heel toe. Open heel toe, open heel toe, open heel toe slap, open open heel toe slap, open heel toe slap, open heel toe slap, open heel toe slap toe, open heel toe slap toe, open heel toe slap toe, open heel toe slap toe heel, open heel toe slap toe heel, open heel toe slap toe heel. Open heel toe slap toe heel toe. <laughs> I messed it up, <laughs> but that's kind of that's the basic tumbao. And a good way to learn this music, and a good way to learn how to fit it into the clave pattern, is to learn the basic tumbao. 
this stuff is all available on YouTube and then learning how to hear the different layers, how to hear heal the how to hear the ma the tumbao, the open heel toe, slap toe, heel toe, as you also become aware of the clave. Open and heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Uh, uh. Open heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Open heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Open heel toe, slap toe, heel toe. Open heel. And then try to learn how to hear those patterns as distinctly separate but part of the same melange. And then there's, uh, you know, any number of patterns you can add. At that point, you can add the uh, uh, martillo or the paila, uh, which is what the uh, timbali plays in the bongo. And this stuff is really, is really great. It kind of really gives you a sense of what this uh, music is all about. Any more questions? So that's the first time I've, uh, that's the first time I've seen the tumbao taught starting with the open tones. I was curious. That's just me. Yeah, that's just me. That's the way I get into. You could also go heel to slap to heel to open. Heel. You can start. You can start the tumbao. I happen to think that it's the human. It's the right of every human being to feel the upbeat. <laughs> in fact, I think it's actually the way most of the world feels music. I've noticed this in all kinds of music. Most most of the planet feels the music in upbeats. We're the only ones to have to hold down the groove. <laughs> We're the only ones that have to nail down the groove. I always hated it. Even when I was a kid, I hated that. Nail down the groove. I don't want to nail down the groove. I want to let the groove free. Is that cool? Just let it go. Let it go. In fact, let go of the groove. <laughs> That's what I wanted to. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Please stop me. If I talk too much, if I bore you, just stop me please. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to share my screen again. And go on. Just talk a little bit about my creative practice. It, is this cool, Renee? Because I know you wanted to spend some time in discussion. Yeah, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to turn to discussion, but do tell us a little bit about your creative process. I think that would be great. Well, the creative practice is really simple, and um, it's just about the different things that I bring to my work as a global citizen of the jazz world. Let me go to um, okay. So now I'm going to share my screen again, and I'll go through this quickly. So I, I don't even have to really go through this a lot. But what I found out is that as a musician, there's a lot of things that I bring to my creative practice. First of all, is an innate curiosity. I'm constantly learning. I don't think I know anything. I want my ass to be kicked. I want to not understand. I want to grow towards understanding, and I want to learn from collaboration. This leads to my practice as a composer, which I try to really do inter intertwine the fields. Uh, I do that consistently. The, gross ghostbuster thing you're not supposed to cross the streams i do cross the streams sometimes i write mambos with tone rows sometimes i write string quartets with afro peruvian rhythms i'm also a performer i'm a pianist i get paid to play the piano periodically so these are all part of the tool set that i bring to my creative practice i'm also a conductor i've been called upon to conduct in my life in the work that i've done creating organizations i've also had to be a uh, develop development make money, raise, raise, fundraise, organize, administrate. Um, I've had to learn to be very interdisciplinary. Very, uh, technology now is, uh, you know, uh, very important. Uh, I'm not very good at it, as you can tell, but technology has become an extremely important part. I was very lucky when I first went to college. I went to City College at the beginning of the uh, Sonic Arts Center. And so I was lucky to learn about uh, uh, the signal path and uh how mixers work and, and how and how outboard equipment works and all of that that we now do in the computer it was actually a uh, board uh, you know it's actually in real real material so that the soundboard is a very very good place to learn about how signal path works um i've also had to somewhat learn to be a scholar though i, I don't really consider myself a scholar at all in my work as a performer as a creator i've had to do all kinds of things um the last recording I did was four questions in which I wrote a concerto for Cornell West. Um, so I had to study his words and actually transcribe the cadence of them and listen to uh, and also 
study the the the, the works and we'll, we'll hear a little bit of that in a second uh four questions is the the, the name of the work that we wrote that, that i wrote for cornell west based on w the voices uh four questions and souls of black folk as a performer i've played in the afro jazz orchestra I, I began my career with garla blay and I've, I've done work with chucho valdez i've done all kinds of interdisciplinary work i've worked with uh, uh, moises kaufman in the tectonic theater company uh, setting Carmen to a musical, making Carmen an afro cuban jazz musical. I've worked with film. I've worked, I've written music for uh, all kinds of salud, a documentary about the Cuban health system. Uh, worked in, with Alan Coulter of Sopranos. And so I've had to do all of it. I'm an activist, most of all. I worked, uh, I just put on a stream called Notes for Votes. I've worked with music for musicians, revolutionary books. I'm constantly a signer of a pledge uh, that refusefascism.org has put out, insisting that uh, that uh, the, present, the present presidential administration not try to uh, terrorize the world into... Uh, into not being able to let go of the uh, the presidency. Uh, Fandango at the Wall, you know about. I created organizations, and one of the most important things that I try to teach people is also to be uh, self-led, to create the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance is my nonprofit, but I, I, I think that people should be creating their own festivals, their own venues, um, again, not waiting for Blue Note to call you, creating your own uh, 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 concert series. Julie Maniscalco is a teacher in... Um, in Staten Island, she works. I think at uh, oh my God, what's the school in Staten Island? Uh, she, she anyway, she she she, I I you know I I I instructed her on how to actually write grants for uh, uh, producing music, and she's in the process of she got a grant to produce a concert at Snug Harbor, which is now all all virtual. But it's very important to be able to create organizations and do things. I create and develop projects. I'm also a fundraiser. I, I've uh, received grants from the Ford Foundation, the Fan Fox, the Arnhem, the blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the point is that you can't just be a teacher. You can't just be a musician. You can't just be any one thing. You have to define your creative practice as a result of many disciplines. And especially now, work is for musician, as you know, has dried up. <laughs> there is no work for musicians. My... Uh, 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 it, my greatest influence was my mother. She was a brilliant artist. This is her from her epitaph in Cuba where we laid her down. Brilliant artist, singer, friend, her life. And this was a lesson that was not lost on me. Her life was her canvas. Her kindness was her paintbrush. Her joy was in giving. And I really found this to be an example for me. Uh, I'm not a pianist. I'm not a composer. I'm a human being. I don't do what I do because I want to be famous or rich or anything. I just do it because I have to, because life demands that we, uh, so I'm going to play you a little bit of the four questions that I wrote, uh, with, uh, Dr. West in mind. And the thing that happened with Dr. West is I actually saw, I've, we've all been watching Dr. West for years, but I finally got to see him, uh, do his thing at Riverside church in a dialogue about revolution and faith. And, um, and I literally saw synesthesia. I saw swirls of color coming out of this man's head. I'll just play you a little bit of it. What a blessing, what an honor, what a privilege to be here with my dear brother, Arturo Alfaro, uh, with the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra. We keep alive a tradition of tremendous nobility and unbelievable royalty. I'm talking about Chico Alfaro and Dizzy Gillespie. I'm talking about James Brown and Tito Puente. I'm talking about Aretha Franklin and say your cruise it's the caravan of love in the language of the Isley Brothers or what John Coltrane called a love supreme. <laughs> So in a way, this is the part of me that really believes that the response mechanism of a human being is to 
be a journalist is to be socially and globally woke. And this is kind of what I what I really believe. I'm going to go on. You heard about Fandango at the Wall. Um, I had the privilege of re- recording uh, a piece uh, called Little Tiny Buildings, a three-movement suite. But this was also a moment of great joy for me because I got to work with Francisco Nunes and the Young People's Chorus of New York City, who just I freaked out. I was able to write for them. And this was on the Fandango at the Wall and the CD. <laughs> These kids are amazing singers. This is all like in minor seconds and strange clusters, and they did it. time for um for discussion so I, I don't want to think about a lot more of your time there's a lot of things that i'm involved in i'm involved in also the uh, we've been doing a stream uh for i created as soon as the pandemic hit i uh i've been playing at 25 years at birdland on sundays 25 years this september would have been the 25th anniversary of the O'Farrell presence at Birdland, and of course the pandemic stopped all that, but I, I, I also felt a sense of urgency, and young musicians, uh, most of whom populate my band, most of them, there's a, a couple of us older guys left, but I, I try to have yearly auditions to diversify the band and to keep young people, and uh, all these young people who gave up their lives to be, I don't know why my chat is, I turned it off. Um, please don't pay attention to my messages, my text messages are showing up. But in any case, um, the uh, uh, it freaked me out that all these young musicians who had dedicated their life to becoming musicians all of a sudden had the lives kicked out from under them. And so I created a, 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 an emergency artist fund. We raised uh, close to $70,000 that we gave out in small grants to musicians, freelance musicians, not just musicians, but to singers, to artists, to stand-up comedians, to dancers. Um, and we've continued to do this. We just opened up that, that, that again. We've opened up that, uh, that pool again. And uh, one of the ways we did it, besides initially raising funds, we also created a program, a streaming program called Virtual Birdland, which we do every Sunday at 8.30 Eastern Time on Facebook and on YouTube. And we've raised funds uh, for musicians uh, uh, with our work at Virtual Birdland. And again, this is my, I'll just show you a taste of what that looks like but this is a hugely difficult process this particular clip i'm playing for you is involves the musicians from kuwait and involves the musicians from new york city and it's what it's typical of what you'll see on a sunday at birdland is recorded in individual homes to Logic, sometimes GarageBand, sometimes Ableton. So we have musicians literally playing together via a digital area, a digital workstation, filming themselves and mixing and video editing this which goes out on Sundays. And we've literally raised thousands and thousands of dollars to help musicians. And we have, every Sunday I look in the chat and there are people from all over the world who, and it democrat, democratizes content because half the people that are watching would never be able to come to New York. It would be cost prohibitive. So my creative practice is, is married to my feelings of globality, of being a global musician, of seeing jazz 
as a global product of seeing our lives as globally interconnected and i think that's the most important the most obviously the most important thing we can do i will say this it's not a political statement racism is the single most dangerous thing to mankind and the antidote to racism is to seeing ourselves in each other throughout the globe and understanding the jazz is a part of that message and part of what we uh Part of what keeps us alive is the idea that we're interconnected like this. And that's why I think sometimes, and I'm especially sensitive to it as a jazz educator, because we educate uh, students about two, five, one chords and uh, chromatic substitutions and bebop scales, and we never fail to talk. I mean, we fail to talk about what jazz is and where it comes from and how it comes from India through Spain, through Africa, through the New World, through all parts of the New World, and goes back out through the Americas to the rest of the planet um we felt to talk about slave the enslaved peoples and how their their suffering produced the, the 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 ground the very ground that we use for the birth of jazz um what can i tell you the other things that i do i'm in the middle of writing i told you a little bit about my opera the story of marcelo lucero um which is a, a very heartbreaking story and um that's kind of a the scenario for the scenery and kind of the staging and uh, I'm working on a, a commission from Columbia University called Mundo Agua, which is uh, about the year of water, did not get to be per, uh, performed. Um, but um, I'd like to open this up uh, to discussion. I'm really curious um, what you guys think. If you have questions for me, I, I consider it a huge privilege to be here with you. I, I can't tell you how much I love and admire all of you. Thank you. So it it seemed to work before to just have you guys just unmute yourselves. And so, um, Juliet, I saw that your hand was up. So why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and jump right in? Hey, I just want to say I was so blown away by your presentation and totally inspired, um, particularly when you started showing that video with all the musicians playing in that difficult set that you put together. <laughs> Uh, that was that was really great. Um, so my question is, so we're going through this transformation as musicians and educators through this pandemic and you're learning, we're all learning so many different ways to communicate together and this whole global connection thing that you're doing is just like, just blows my mind. I love it so much, especially with musicians because it's so cost prohibitive to get them here and to hear what they have to do and, and collaborate with them. So the question is, what do you see um, take, the takeaways from when this is all gonna be over eventually? What, what, what things are sort of standing out to you as a takeaway that's gonna change the musical landscape of how we perform together and, and how we um, work together in the future? Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great question um, because a lot of people see this moment as a crushing defeat of teaching and and it's it's very strange indeed but i don't take well to defeat or crushing moments of anything and in fact um what i think this is going to do is is going to open up an entire platform of, of skill sets that we need to really cope with like zooming um because it's not going to go away when the pandemic is lifted and people return to human life, Zoom is still a platform where we can interact and learn from musicians across the globe. Master classes, uh, in, even, even, even um, ensemble experience. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. This is what I've been doing with my class at UCLA. It's just it's just a second and it's worth it because I think it'll give you all kinds of crazy notions of what you can accomplish because you're willing to not be scared of technology and you're willing to look at different um, different ways to to understand. So this is a, a program called Tune Bend, and what they did at UCLA is they canceled all ensembles. All ensembles were canceled, and I said no 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 no. We can't have that. And I happen to know a friend of mine named Matt Garrison who has, runs Shapeshifter. And he's working with a program called Toonbend that allows a Zoom-like work environment. So I'm going to, uh, let me see if I can sign in. 
Okay, I'm gonna sign in. So this is what this is what Tune Band looks like. This is what I have my musicians doing at UCLA. Let me just get rid of all this stuff. This is kind of the wave of the future because you don't have to stop teaching in a room to be able to interact with ensembles uh, from all over the world. It's just something that doesn't have to happen. Uh-oh. It's not letting me in. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to do, show it to you. Sorry, but anyway, what it is is that I I look at I, I look at these things. I look at all of these things as opportunities to reinvent ourselves, and I think that technology will not go away, and I think that the teaching of the person, the face to face teaching, can only be enhanced by programs. I don't know why you're not letting me in. I wish I could do this. Okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, I hope that I hope that I, I really want to show you this program in the worst way, but it's, it's just not. I'll, I'll check it out. I mean, I'm some. Yeah, call, check it out. It's called TuneBand, and what it does, it's a set. It's 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 only an iOS platform, but it's a set of tiles, and each tile is a musician with an individual mute, solo, or record button. So you can mix and match. You can put yourself in the center of the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra and replace Yvonne Renta with your tenor part. It's it's really it's completely oh, wow. awesome. That's great. Yeah, it's amazing. And then the program, for instance, you can have there. There's one of the demonstration programs they have is a composition by uh, I think it's Matt's composition, but there, he has four pianists. So you can compare Aaron Parks uh, playing the part uh, or Chick Corea. Uh, and it's 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 really an incredible learning tool. Everything has to be reinvented. Everything, because when we return, we're going to find the world uh, really different. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Wonderful, Marcus. Do you want to jump in? Hi, hi, Arturo. How are you? Good. How are you? It's it's so good to actually speak to you in person. Um, I, I just I just wanted to tell you that my kids right now were. Um, we're studying bits and pieces of your four questions because uh, we're doing a whole unit on um, social justice and uh, civic uh, duty and, and, and courageous conversation. So I've been mixing in and interpolating some of your uh, music, such as um, the cacophones and and you know, and then the past album of yours. I think I've discussed this with you before. The in a sentimental mood with some of uh, Toni Morrison and Lynn Miranda and Juno Diaz's and Tanasi Coates's material. Wow. Uh, it, it's a, a sort of a myriad of voices that represent, you know, social justice and also sort of like the joy of bringing music and literature together. And I just want to tell you that my kids, um, because I've introduced some of your stuff, but I've also, you know, played some of my favorites, like, you know, Carmen McRae and Shirley Horn and and even Mingus, um, the kids feel a lot more empowered to, you know, to write about their experiences because of the sounds and the tone and the moods they hear. So not only is it working for like regions prep, <laughs> test prep, but it's working for uh, some creativity and some really fantastic ideas coming out of them and ways to tackle, you know, injustice right now. So I just want to tell you that in person and thank you. I really thank you those are incredible words i mean i you know it's hard as you all know it's a hard it's a hard gig being a teacher or being an artist um there's no real uh there's no real financial windfall there's no and especially when you play this music you know, it's not really about fame um but it's about changing lives and i i, I literally was talking uh to terence blanchard who was also on the faculty of ucla the day and we, were, we were both remarking that if you want to help young people deal with the trauma yeah. of this period have help them create their answer to this trauma help them create help them be help them put their their fear and their horror into their art and they will excise much 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 uh, anxiety that way so what you're doing is right spot right on thank you thank you I think we have time for one more question. If someone would like to jump in. Good 
there's so much to think about here, um, both in terms of music and that concept of citizenry and the, the kind of connections that you've created across cultures. Anybody like to take up a final question? Uh, yeah, about the opera. I'm just curious, how do you see the timeline now with the pandemic and how do you envision if it's happening when and well it's 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 definitely not going to happen um anytime soon but we're actually in discussion we we just got uh some grant money we went into we had a workshop we went to uh ecuador and uh so but for now i think the th trick is to continue to develop we're in conversation with the mellon foundation about setting up a series of you know, real workshops, a good two thirds of it is written. And, uh, um, I would love to see this. I'll tell you about the opera cause I think it's very timely. It's about a, a time period in Patchogue when a politician was using, uh, Latinos as scapegoats for, uh, the dismal failures of the banking industry and the real estate industry and the collusion of speculative investments. And so he was going around uh, Patchogue telling people that uh, the immigrants were the cause of all their economic woes. And the uh, Patchogue Police Department was very notorious about looking the other way when immigrants were beat up on and hurt. And um, so it was kind of open season. And they had this thing called Mexican hunting. And this young man, and by the way, I don't paint him as, 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 as an enemy either, but this young man... And a bunch of his uh, friends went out Mexican hunting, and um, and happened upon Marcelo, and uh, and Marcelo had the audacity to fight back, to resist, and so he lost his life. And um, I think it's very prophetic. This happened in two thousand eight, and we could we could not have a better picture of the pandemic of fear that uh, Donald Trump has brought on all our lives. And so I think, in a way, I'm looking at this as a work that that could be cast in the future, even though it's very time and site specific, because it talks about the idea of learning from history. So I, 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 could, it would, I would have to take a year off to fully orchestrate it and, and fully uh, realize it, but we're, we're hard at work. I have a publicist and we'd love to see it come to, to fruition in a year or two, if mm. such a thing were possible. That's, it sounds like a really exciting uh, prospect. I hope you'll, you, we can find a way to, to have you come back and we could share somehow this performance together because it really sounds like an extraordinary experience. Well, it, it's always this awful moment when I notice that the clock is suggesting that it's time that we part paths and but I always know that nobody particularly wants to. Um, and so I want to uh, acknowledge that it's the end of a long and very complex and difficult week. And I can't fathom something I would rather have been doing at the end of this hard week. Um, and so I would like to thank all of you teachers for being here, for making uh, this such a rich experience. And Arturo, um, thank you so much for sharing this unbelievable talent and creativity and curiosity and set of connections. And uh, it's really an extraordinary picture of global citizenry and I can't thank you enough. So, yeah, so I will wish everyone um, a, a sigh of relief, hopefully, as we learn the end of this uh, election. And I'll wish you all a very nice evening and a really fine weekend. Thank you, teachers. Thank you so much, Arturo. Thank you. Thank you, family. Thank you.